Good evening. I must say it is, as Pastor Nats has mentioned last week, it is good to be here actually with all of you here this uh, evening. And as you probably noticed, like everybody else, I too need a haircut. <laughs> I know it's hard to get to the barber, but I will do it myself. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it is good to be here because our service this evening is uh, the... Uh, service of the word as printed, but it also is the focus on the wonderful thing that you and I enjoy through God's love, and that is his grace. Grace is God's undeserved love for us, and the very fact that in that love, he has set us free from sin. He has given to us the comfort, the joy of knowing that our sins have been completely washed away in the blood of our Lord Jesus, and we have the glory of eternal life, and that's what always gives us comfort, strength, and hope. And that's our focus of our service this evening. Let's begin by singing our first hymn, hymn 385, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. I invite you to stand for the opening invocation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. 
We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O Lord God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture reading this evening is found recorded in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verses 18 to 21, and also verses 26 through 28. In these words of our Lord, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel before they were about to enter into the promised land. And as they are about to do that, Moses reminds them of the importance of making sure that they follow God's word to obey his decrees, the laws that he has set before them. In fact, he actually encourages them that they, that they put his word, actually in a sense like they tie it on their very midst, their clothing, everything, in a sense to remind that it should be a part of their everyday life. And if they follow the Lord's word and listen to him, he will always be with them. We read, Put these words of mine in your hearts and in your soul, and tie them on your wrists as signs and as symbols on your forehead. Teach them to your children by talking about them when you sit in your house and when you travel on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many on the land that the Lord promised to your forefathers with an oath, as many as the days that the heavens remain over the earth. You see... I am placing before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, or the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God and you turn away from the path that I am commanding you today by walking after other gods whom you did not know. This is God's word. We'll join this evening in singing Psalm 78 a psalm that reminds us of God's word in, in keeping his commandments, that we are to keep his word in, in our life each and every day. Psalm 78. <laughs>
Our second reading this evening is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 through 25 and 27 to 28. These words will also be the basis for our sermon this evening. And in these words, we are reminded that you and I enjoy God's grace, that is his undeserved love. And in that love, he has given to us the comfort and the assurance of forgiveness and life that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is ours simply through faith in him. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. This is God's word. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Out of respect for our gospel reading this evening, I invite you to stand. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. In these words, they are a portion of Jesus' sermon on the mount, and he reminds his disciples to watch out for those who really are false prophets, who will come in his name, but will teach a message opposite of what the Lord has brought. And he reminds us that those who stand firmly rooted in the truth of God's word are those who have, in a sense, have built their house on bedrock, where those who look at the things of this world are like those who have built their house on really sinking sand, we read. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. You do not gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, do you? So then, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who, who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on bedrock. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house but it did not fall, because it was founded on bedrock. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. It was completely destroyed. When Jesus finished speaking these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not like their experts in the law. This is the gospel of the Lord.
You may be seated as we sing our next hymn, By Grace I'm Saved. My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us bow our heads. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 
As I mentioned, the words for our sermon this evening, our second reading there, Paul's letter to the Romans, we've heard those words, so I'll not read them again. My brothers and sisters, I want to start out this evening by sharing with you an event in the life of Jesus that illustrates in many ways what most people think when it comes to eternal life, in other words, to getting to heaven. And we can even at times find ourselves thinking along the same lines as we look at this event in the life of, of Jesus. It's just a very natural response to of being human beings. And the event was this. A young man approached Jesus one day, and he came up to the Lord, and he said, Lord, teacher, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? His question really is one that I think in all ways everyone asks in one form or another. What do I have to do to get to heaven? How do I have eternal life? And do you know what Jesus' answer was to this young man? No, he did not say to him, don't worry about it, you don't have anything to do, I got it covered. His answer was this. He said, why do you ask me about what is good? Only one is good. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Jesus was not telling this young man, by the way, that if he were to keep the commandments, he could gain eternal life. Rather, he told them this so that he would come to the realization that he was imperfect, that he lacked the goodness, the perfection, the holiness that is necessary to have eternal life. And that the young man didn't grasp. You see, the young man thought that he had kept the commandments perfectly. He had talked to Jesus and says, well, which one? I've kept, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shouldn't, you know. And he'd gone through them. He said, I kept all those. So what more do I really need to do? I'm good. But then Jesus made it very clear to him that he was not. He lacked the goodness that was necessary when he told him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. This the rich young man could not and would not do. And so he walked away from Jesus. You see, he was made to realize that he didn't love God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. He was not perfect. And afterwards, the disciples turned to their Lord and said, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus' answer to his disciples is really the key. Because he told his disciples, with people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When it comes to eternal life, what you and I cannot do, what is impossible for you and I to do, God has done for us. And it all has to do with God's amazing grace. So you see, that's really the key. God's grace, God's love. That's the answer. Because it is in his love, God has done everything for us, what we cannot do for ourselves. Eternal life. Going to heaven has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with God himself and his amazing love for, for all people. To understand this, to grasp the significance and, and the incredible love that God has for us and the gift of eternal life that he has given to you and to me in that love, I think we first have to come to the realization and to the understanding that we are completely removed from the equation. We have no part in it. It's not God plus us. There is no us in that equation. You see, God does not love us because we first loved him. God does not shower his love on us because we're deserving of that love. Not at all. No, God's grace 
His love, as the Greek word agape indicates, is undeserved. It is given despite us. Agape, undeserved love. If you and I look at what we deserve, it's not God's love. It's not his mercy, it's not his compassion, but rather his righteous judgment and punishment. And that's why the Apostle Paul goes on in these words that he wrote to the Romans and said to them, in fact, there is no difference. There's no difference between any and everyone. And that is this, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all come up short. Eternal life requires perfection, complete and total righteousness. Nothing less will do. We cannot say that our goodness, our righteousness is, oh, it's, it's good enough. It's better than others. Or it's close enough. You know, I may be just off a little bit. Doesn't that count? Not at all. It's all or nothing. Either we are good and perfect and righteous in and of ourselves, or we are not. And the sad truth is, we're not. There is no one who, is, who does good, not even one. And we're no exception to that rule. Adam and Eve have saw, saw to that when they openly and consciously rebelled against God. That one act of disobedience by them has become our act of disobedience. Their DNA of sin has been embedded into our DNA. We are no less sinful than they. We are no less deserving of God's righteous judgment and punishment than if we ourselves ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there is nothing, nothing we can do to alter that fact. As Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me ask you this. Who is a good person? What makes a person good? Do you consider yourself to be a good person? And if so, on what basis? But before you get too carried away with that thought, let me ask you this. Think about something. I don't, each of you will have a different thought in mind. But think about this. Picture in your mind something so horrible, so disgusting, so revolting that it makes you sick to your stomach thinking about it. Every time you think about it, every time you hear about it, every time you see it, it sets, it sets your blood to boiling. It, it makes you be filled with rage and, and anger that you want to lash out and, and, and destroy the very thing that, that upsets you. You cannot accept that repulsive, disgusting thing no matter what. It doesn't matter who does it or what it is. It just sets you just your blood curdling and makes you sick. Have you thought of it? What that is? Well, you know what it is? It's you. It's me. You see, you and I are the repulsive, horrible, disgusting, revolting thing that God sees because of our sins without Christ. We're an abomination to God. There's nothing good in us. There is nothing worthy in us. There is absolutely nothing at all. And yet, it is his amazing grace that leads, leads God to love the unlovable, to love us. The Apostle Paul, a little later in this letter that he wrote to the Romans, said these beautiful words about God's love. He said, God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still that horrible, revolting, disgusting thing, Christ Jesus died for us. God's love is not in response to our love for him. 
It's not in response to something that we have done for him. God's love is purely a response, an action on his part to us, separate from us. It has nothing to do with us. And well, I know that. And well, you know it. I know for myself I'm not deserving of that love. I know for myself I fall way short of the glory of God. There is nothing good or righteous in me. I know for myself that I do not deserve that love of the Lord, but rather his righteous punishment. But I'm very thankful by the grace of God, I also know the amazing love that he has for me. A love that he has for you, a love that he has for all people, so that what did he do? He came into this world and he died for us. God's amazing love is ours simply because of what Christ Jesus has done for us and not what we have done for him. That's why Paul goes on in the very next verse when he says we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and goes on to say this. He says, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's God's grace. And what an amazing word that is, grace, love, a word that is so comforting and, and reassuring and peace-rendering to hear in our ears. In fact, one person defined God's grace with this phrase. He, he, they said, grace is this, God's riches at Christ's expense. Taking the first letter of, each, of, of, of that word, making the sentence. God's riches at Christ's expense. And how appropriate and fitting that definition is. You and I are the benefactors of God's love and forgiveness. Why? Because God the Father made his Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Christ died for you and me, not to make us better Christians, but rather to make us Christians. He died for you and me so that he could remove our sinfulness from us and clothe us instead in his righteousness. Without Christ's sacrifice, without Christ taking our sins, our sinfulness upon himself and suffering his Father's wrath in our place, without Christ bearing with himself in the grave our guilt and rising again, we would be forever condemned before our Father in heaven but we're not because God in his grace did for us what we cannot do. He redeemed us. That is, he brought us back from the soul-destroying slavery of sin and made us alive in Christ Jesus. What he did for us is ours through faith. Simply believing, trusting that what God did is ours. Faith trusts in that. And even faith itself is a gift of God's grace. And through faith, we know that we are justified. As a little boy defined it, just as if I'd ever sinned. That's what it means. Or maybe to think of it this way. I know a few of you are old enough, some of you are not, but do you remember the old mimeograph machines that when you used to have to make copies you didn't have a copier that you could just put that type thing on and ran off or anything else. You had this mimeograph machine where you first have to type out a stencil and then carefully put it on that roll, on that machine, and then hand crank it, or if you're lucky, you might have had an electric one, and then it would print off copies. Well, I'm old enough to know that because when I started in the ministry, that's how I did the Sunday bulletins each week with a mimeograph machine. And I have to tell you, I was a horrible typist. It's very slow, mistake-ridden. But I was thankful for the, to the Lord for the wonderful invention of whiteout. Those of you who are old enough know what I'm talking about. For all you young folks, that's the delete button on your computer, you know, where you can make a mistake and you just hit delete or backspace. Well, whiteout is that wonderful little tool that when you type the wrong letter, you simply just took a little whiteout, covered it, and then you could type the correct letter. 
And that way, using that whiteout, I was able to run off a clean bulletin. But if you were to look at my stencil, it was practically whited out with all the mistakes I'd made. You see, that's really what Christ has done for us. He has whited out all of our sins, all of our mistakes. He has completely removed them. And they've been completely removed so that what God sees through Christ Jesus is you and me covered in Christ's righteousness. Our sins have been whited out. God sees a perfect printed page. He sees us as if we had never sinned. That's God's grace in our life. And that is what you and I have through Christ Jesus. And it is ours through faith. Simply believing and knowing the love that God has for us and what he did for us in that love. Yes, God's amazing grace. It's an incredible gift that you and I enjoy by the grace of God. A gift forever to be treasured. A gift forever to be thankful for. A gift that he has bestowed upon you in your baptism a gift that he continually gives to you through the Lord's Supper and through his gospel message, his word of forgiveness. Yes, God's grace, it truly is amazing. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join and confess our faith in our Lord with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Normally at this time, we would be having our offering to be taken, uh, but again, just to try and follow some uh, safety protocol, there are offering plates at each of the entrances. Uh, Some of you have already done it before the service, but you may also leave your offering there in one of the plates after the service. Now that I got you to sit down, I'll ask you to stand up again for prayer. (laughs) O gracious Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how great is your love for all mankind. In your love for us, which we did not deserve, you came into this world and became one with us so that through your life, your life of perfect obedience that we could not live, you lived. And through your death, the death that we rightly, we rightfully deserve because of our sins, you have set us free from the wrath of our Father in heaven. You have given to us the comfort, the joy, and the peace of forgiveness that we have through you. And it is ours simply by faith. Believing and trusting in what you did is ours. Even that faith that we have is a gift of your grace. O Lord, we can never thank you enough for your great love for us. But we ask that you ever fill our hearts with the same love so that we will love one another as you have loved all all people. So bless us and ever keep us in your grace until that day you come again in glory to bring us to our eternal home in heaven. And also, dear Lord, we come to you with thankful hearts for your love that you have showered upon Todd Gross, 
the son of Ralph and, and Esther Gross, who needed, well, in a sense, you could say almost emergency surgery to have his gallbladder removed. We are very thankful that all went well and, and now ask that you will bless his recovery here at St. Joseph Hospital. We ask that you'll re each day re help him to regain his strength and, and that no complications arise and that before long he will be able to leave the hospital and join his family. In the meantime, give him the comfort and the assurance of your abiding love and presence each and every day. And also, dear Lord, I personally come to you along with my wife, Linda, in giving you great thanks and praise as we celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary this coming weekend. Accept our heartful thanks for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. As companions, we have journeyed through life together. We have loved and consoled and supported each other. But most important, by your grace and your blessing, we have grown closer to you. By your grace, you have also blessed us with a Christian family and would have been blessed with being able to raise our children in the knowledge of your love so that they too know you as their Lord and Savior. We have also learned forgiveness and unconditional love from you, and your word has been a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. May we keep your word truly close to our hearts so that we remain committed to each other and especially to you and ask for your continued blessings upon us. And so, dear Lord, we pray this to the glory of your name. And even now, join together in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come.
I invite you to stand as we close with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Again, good evening to all. It's great seeing you. I invite all of you to sign the guest book as visitors, since I haven't seen you for a while. I probably have forgotten your names, so I will be standing up here. You can refresh my memory and introduce yourself once again. That's what happens when you get old. <laughs> Anyways, God's blessing. It's great to see you here this evening. Uh, be safe and have a wonderful weekend. 
Look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.